Moog, the Lord of Blood, the herald and creator of the Mogwin dynasty, is an almost paradoxical character. Cursed with omen blood at birth, shunned and hated, Moog was never expected to become anything. Yet Moog fundamentally changed the lands between with his actions during the War of the Shattering, by kidnapping Mikola and birthing the Mogwin dynasty under the formless mother. He loves blood loss so much, he's even weak to it himself. From an outside view, he seems delusional, deep beneath the earth, ranting about an outer god, his goals distant and unobtainable. But we were wrong. Perhaps these weren't the ramblings of someone insane, but the meticulous planning of a master. This is part one of two separate videos on Moog. Part one will be on Moog being an omen, what lies under Leyendel, and the Formless Mother, with an extra theory about what the Formless Mother could be. Part 2 will be about the Land of Reeds, Moog's cult, how Moog could be the answer to some of the other outer gods, and Mikola. This video contains spoilers and assumes you have finished the game at least once. Turn back now, ye tarnished, lest ye be spoiled. Ugh. Sometime before the Shattering, Moog was born to Queen Marika during her first marriage with Elden Lord Godfrey. They had twins both affected with the Omen Curse, which they named Moog and Morgoth. Let's talk about Moog's name. There are multiple possibilities for what Moog's name could mean. A quick aside, I don't necessarily believe most of these translations were taken into account by FromSoft, besides maybe the initial Welsh one. In fact, many parts of this video will be inferences from the very little information we do have. These translations, however, remain interesting, so I will continue to share them with you nonetheless. Moog itself doesn't seem to mean anything. Mogwin, however, does have some roots in Welsh. Win seems to mean white, silver, darling, fat, ripe, or blessed. The important one to note here is the word blessed. This could suggest Mogwin means something along the lines of the blessed dynasty of Moog. Another thing to note is the war surgeons wearing white could have an albeit tenuous connection. The word Mogwin, without the H, could mean harvest. However, this carries little weight to it. Mogwin itself is also Welsh and could mean moan. This is somewhat ironic as Moog's last words after his death is him moaning the word Mogwin. Finally, in Hindi, the word Mohag means infatuation, or at least Mo means love. I couldn't find any evidence of this being a word actually used by Hindi speakers. Nevertheless, this is also scarily perfect for Moog, considering his seemingly strange love for a slumbering Mikola. There's also some indication that Mikola inspires infatuation in others. Very few people speak ill of him. But let us return to the life of Moog. As I mentioned before, both Moog and Morgoth were born omens. This very quickly leads us to ask, what is an omen? The word omen means an event regarded as a portent of good or evil, or something of prophetic significance. Looking at Moog and Morgoth, at a quick glance, we can see that both share very gnarled horns across their bodies. Moog's, however, are far more prominent and darkened. Margit also has a tale which is somewhat similar to the tales of the Misbegotten. In fact, he shares some general similarities to them. In the subterranean shunning grounds below Leyendel, we can find the Omen Bairn, which gives us an insight into what an omen is. It reads, Doll of a Curseborn Bairn uses FP to unleash wraiths that chase down foes. Omen babies have all their horns excised, causing most to perish. These fetishes are made to memorialize them. Please don't hate me or curse me, please. The people of the lands between hate or even fear the omens enough that they are willing to cut the horns off of literal babies, causing agonizing pain and likely death. And that's just the tip of this horrifying iceberg. We can find several omen ogres around the lands between. They are large, brutish beings with their horns still intact. The regal omen bairn, which we can get by trading Morgoth's remembrance, reads, Doll of a curse-born bairn from the Erd Tree's royal line. Uses FP to unleash many wraiths that chase down foes. Omen babies born of royalty do not have their horns excised, but instead are kept underground, unbeknownst to anyone, imprisoned for eternity. These memorial fetishes are fashioned in secret. The omen ogres we fight come from one of two places. 
They were either nobles who were imprisoned in the subterranean shunning grounds, or their parents couldn't bear to have their horns excised, saving them from an early grave. Moog himself is one of the former, but perhaps also somewhat the latter, though we have little evidence to suggest that. As for the former, Moog was an omen both shunned and shackled quite literally. Moog and Morgoth have shackles you can find, Morgoth's being called Margit Shackle. Moogs can be found guarded by two lobsters in the shunning grounds, and it reads, A fetish bathed in golden magic, shackles were used to bind the accursed people called the Omen, and these ones were made to keep a particular Omen under the strictest confinement. Although faint, the shackles still retain vestiges of power, enough to trap the once bound Moog on Earth, if only for a short time. Golden Magic links this item very cleanly to Marika and the Golden Order, but the fact that the Shackle cannot hold him anymore does show both the strength that Moog has reached and perhaps the time since the initial ritual was cast on the Shackle. Either way, it does not hold him for long, and it doesn't even do anything to him in his second phase. The omen were so hated and reviled that people began to take up arms to kill them, and perhaps for good reason. The omen cleaver weapon is a curved greatsword that the omens are strong enough to hold in one hand. It reads, Heavy bladed curved sword of colossal size awarded to omen as a tool of war. This weapon is made to take advantage of brute strength. The pattern etched upon the blade is the remnant of a deteriorating maldiction. Indeed, when bestowing a weapon, preparations must be made for taking it away. Maldiction is usually a curse or magic, which makes a lot of sense. You don't give a weapon of this size and power to a monster you have on a leash, without a way to take that power back. But the omens wandering around aren't all under a master. Some like the one in Godric's castle likely are, but many are assumed to be free to roam the lands between or in the catacombs below them. There is a good example of this in the fell omen twins at the capital outskirts. After killing them, we can get the spirits of Omen Killer Rolo. It reads, Spirit of Rolo, known as the first Omen Killer. Once a famous perfumer, Rolo imbibed a physique to rid himself of emotion, thus enabling him to enact his nightmarish labour, hunting the Omen. This tells us a lot. First, Omen Killers do exist. You may have encountered and killed some, in fact, and they are organised enough to look similar to each other. Secondly, at least some of these Omen Killers were once perfumers. Perfumers, we know from their cookbooks, were once physicians. What could lead someone whose life work was to help people to such depravity and violence? Thirdly, it tells us that at least Rolo believed it was an important enough and horrid enough task that he needed to erase his very emotions to complete it. From the other Omen Killers, we can get the Great Omen Killer Cleaver. It reads, The blade of this huge, loathsome some cleaver comprises a row of amputated omen horns, weapons of slaughter wielded by omen killers. The hideous horns cause blood loss, adding vibrant colours to the ongoing mayhem. The omen killers not only hunted the omen, they used weapons fashioned from the body parts of their brethren against them. The final piece of the puzzle is the omen smirk mask, dropped by a lesser omen killer in Leyendel. Mask with long, twisted horns worn by omen killers, increases strength, bears the smirking face of an elder, twisted in wicked delight. This visage is carved in the image of the evil spirits that haunt the omen in their nightmares. The omen killers not only use the horns of their prey to taunt them, but also images of the evil spirits they see in their nightmares. This also illuminates why the omen bairn and regal omen bairn unleash phantoms. The phantoms are literally the evil spirits which they see in their nightmares. This is backed up by the cursed blood pot, which reads, decorated with the crest of the Lord of Blood. Throw at enemies to doubt them in accursed blood, causing summoned spirits to assail them with rapid fervour, a childhood memory of the Lord of Blood. Moog was born into this accursed blood. He had no choice in the matter. His nights were filled with spirits assailing him, and his days with omen killers. His blood was cursed, and for that he was shunned, shackled, hated, and hunted. Here is where the theories truly begin. The omen killer in the village of Albanaix drops the crucible knot talisman after it is killed. It reads, A talisman fashioned from a bony knot that embodies the aspects of various creatures, said to have grown on the human body long ago, a vestige of the crucible of primordial life. Born partially of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. 
While this is a knot and not a horn, the fact is that beings in the lands between once saw the crucible and its tumorous blessings, knots and horns, as good things, and now they don't. We can see knots like this mostly on misbegotten creatures. The misbegotten are also marginalized, much like the omen. Not quite hunted, but enslaved and hated. But here's where it gets even stranger. The crucible knights, which have crucible in the name, can have armor that has tree-like horns. An example of this is Crucible Knight Soluria. The Crucible Knights even have tail spin attacks, much like Margit does. To add to this even more, all of the Crucible Talismans, Feather, Knot, and Scale, have a line that says, said to have grown on the human body long ago. With this, we can safely speculate that omens are beings that were blessed by the crucible, and the tumor-like horns, or knots, or feathers, or scales, are growths to signify the original gnarled great tree. As Marika and the greater will took over the lands between, the original power of the crucible was shunned and hunted. But perhaps it goes even beyond that. Jumping back to the word omen, there may be significance in these beings. They embody beings that don't fit into the greater will's goals of a changed golden lands between. Prophets of a way that is being ousted. They truly are omens of a bygone age. We're going to take a quick sidetrack here to point out some cut content. This includes an NPC named Viscount Shornheit. This content is interesting, but really isn't very relevant to this video specifically. If you're interested, go watch Ratatuska's video on Margit. Link in the description. But moving on, now that we understand what it means to be born like Moog, we need to understand what Moog's earlier years were like. The golden city of Leyendel hides a terrible secret in its sewers. The subterranean shunning grounds, which we've mentioned already, is a maze of catacombs and twisting sewers that hold many deadly monsters, including many omen ogres. But there is far worse even further in. Following a winding path, you can find yourself in the Cathedral of the Forsaken, where you fight Moog the Omen. Defeating him is not an easy task, but once the deed is done, something strange happens. No words, no second phase, he simply dies in a golden mist and the player receives the Blood Flame Talons incantation. This is not Moog, not really. Behind him there is a path to the Frenzied Flame which he seems to be protecting. Now as many will already know, Margit dies in a very similar way both of the times you can fight him. Margit is Morgot in an illusionary form and this is much the same an illusion of Moog. The OST for this fight is even called the Omen Illusion. At a glance, it seems most likely that this is made by Morgot, considering he can make illusions of himself. This could suggest that he and Moog are still in contact, or that they seem to still care for each other. However, this illusion persists after Morgot dies, whereas Margot's illusion does not. It also persists after Moog's death in the Mogwin dynasty. On top of this, Morgot has also left a seal behind which blocks the path to the Frenzied Flame itself, so he already has a countermeasure in place. All of these added together lead us to believe that this is most likely a permanent illusion that doesn't have any ties to either of them, at least not anymore. This does make sense as it defends the path to the Frenzied Flame, a world-ending outer god. Therefore, the illusion would need to remain to defend the path even if both of them happen to perish as a last line of defense. It's also important to consider when the Omen Illusion was actually placed here. We know that after we defeat it, it doesn't come back and that Vike did indeed see the Frenzied Flame at one point. We don't really have any evidence on whether it can be recast or reformed. And this leaves us with the rather perplexing answer that either it can be recast and Vike was somehow strong enough to defeat both the Omen and get through Morgoth's seal, or more likely, these measures were put in place after Vike had come and gone a contingency to a threat which had already proved its terrifying worth. Despite being twins, Moog and Morgoth had two very different reactions to the abuse they received from their parents and the world at large. Morgoth does his best to make up for something he has no control over, and Moog gets angry and embraces his differences. I do find it very interesting just how polar opposite these reactions are, and yet it is shown that neither are really beneficial to the individual. It does not make Marika or Godfrey love them, unless you count the start of Godfrey's cutscene where he acknowledges Morgoth, and they do both end up dead at the hands of the Tarnished. 
The Cathedral of the Forsaken, where we fight Moog the Omen, is a very significant place, as this is likely where Moog had his outer godly epiphany. The cathedral seems to venerate death and Erd tree burials. We can tell by considering the roots coming through the ceiling, and the holes in the walls for the bodies to be placed. The roots would reabsorb the dead and rebirth them again anew in a time before destined death was taken from the Elden Ring. In this place of death, Moog found the blood-loving outer god he called the Mother of Truth. She also goes by the more common name, the Formless Mother. She showed Moog the truth. The truth that his accursed blood was not a curse, but a blessing. The Blood Boon Incantation, which can be gained by giving Moog's remembrance to Enya, reads, Sacred Incantation of Moog, Lord of Blood. Thrust arm into the body of the Formless Mother, then scatter the blood flame to set the area ablaze. The Mother of Truth craves wounds. When Moog stood before her, deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire and besotted with the defilement that he was born into. This tells us several things. Firstly, this is where blood flame comes from. Moog's accursed blood is set aflame by the Formless Mother. Secondly, it tells us what the Formless Mother wanted. Wounds? in any way, shape, or form. And thirdly, that this accursed blood is his. It is his omen blood transformed and given power by the Formless Mother. But perhaps finally and most importantly, actual attack of the Blood Boon doesn't use his blood, but the Formless Mother's. All the attacks Moog makes between both his omen and Lord of Blood fight are him piercing the Formless Mother and using her strength. The Moogwin Sacred Spear, obtained as an alternative trade for his remembrance, reads, Trident of Moog, Lord of Blood, a sacred spear that will come to symbolize his dynasty. As well as serving as a weapon, it is an instrument of communion with an outer god who bestows power upon accursed blood. The Mother of Truth desires a wound. This means his iconic Nihil is him piercing the Formless Mother in order to commune with her. Also take note that in this, a place of death, Moog found the power of blood. His blood. Where is my mother? The Formless Mother is an outer god, and at the most basic level, we know what outer gods want. The word formless makes perfect sense for her, considering she has no physical form that we can encounter. As an outer god, much like the others in the game, she likely needs pawns like Moog, Vare and Okuna to do her dirty work and allow her to influence the lands between. In the name of the Formless Mother, Moog kidnapped Mikula, the Unalloyed. This most likely happened during the Shattering, while Melania was fighting Radan and Kaelid. An odd theory I've heard recently is that Mikula is the Formless Mother. Mikula, while in his cocoon in the Halig Tree, managed to influence Moog to complete his plan. We know that Mikula has some amount of influence over others, but this doesn't really make any sense. What could make sense, however, is that Mikula was intended to be a vessel for the Formless Mother. As an outer god, the Formless Mother wishes to supplant the Greater Will as the god of the lands between. Mikula would become the new Marika, he fits this role perfectly as an Empyrean, and Moog would become the new Elden Lord as his consort. This is backed up by the Moog Remembrance, which reads, Remembrance of Moog, Lord of Blood, hewn into the Erd Tree. Wishing to raise Mikula to full godhood, Moog wished to become his consort, taking the role of monarch. But no matter how much of his bloody bedchamber he tried to share, he received no response from the young Empyrean. This plan, so far at least, seemingly was not panning out for Moog, but all he required was Mikula to awaken from his slumber. At this point, Mikula is indeed irreparably changed. In the introduction cutscene of the game, we can see Mikula looks almost like a young child, but in Moog's arena, he is in a cocoon. All we can see is a disgusting, warped hand. We'll talk more about Mikula in the second part of this video. Another interesting concept is the idea that the Sea of Blood in the Mogwin Dynasty is the Formless Mother, or perhaps even her current vessel. It would make sense as a tangible place for Moog's attacks to come from. He's simply making portals into the Sea of Accursed Blood. However, this is purely speculation as we have no real evidence for this. One thing we can see clearly, however, is that the Outer Gods are most influential underground. Almost like the roots of this world are corrupted, with the Greater Will and the Erd Tree unable to quell the otherworldly beings lurking below. There is evidence to suggest that the Formless Mother is also embodied or viewed as a blood star. The aberrant sorceries, Boreas of Sin and Punishment, much like the Bloody Slash and Seppuku Art of Wars, require you to harm yourself to cast them. Bloody Slash, however, is the only one with direct ties to Moog. It reads, Blood Oath Skill granted by the Lord of Blood. From a low stance, coat the blade in your own blood to unleash a rending blood slash in a wide arc. With this connection in mind, the Briar Sorceries are shed in a new light. 
Briars of Punishment is particularly interesting and it reads, an aberrant sorcery discovered by exiled criminals. Theirs are the sorceries most reviled by the Academy. Wounds the caster with thorns of sin, sending a trail of blood thorns running over the ground to impale enemies from below. This sorcery can be casted repeatedly. The guilty, their eyes gouged by thorns, live in eternal darkness. There, they discover the blood star. Another case perhaps of the formless mother approaching a group of marginalized individuals and granting them power at the cost of wounds. Once they commune at enough of a cost, this cost being wounds, they see the true form of the formless mother, the blood star. The great star's morning star is perhaps even more interesting. It reads, huge bludgeon with three stars at the striking end. Though primarily a striking weapon, the star's spikes cause blood loss. A bloodstained star is an ill omen, a fact not lost upon those against who this weapon is brought to bear. A bloodstained star is an ill omen. The wording of this seems far too specific for me to dismiss. Connecting omens and the bloody star like this really does lend to the thought that the formless mother and Moog have been at this for quite some time. Alongside this, Outer gods being seen as distant, unknowable stars makes a lot of sense. The area of Nokron is sat directly under what is visually a sea of stars and is accessed by a star quite literally falling into it. We've also seen some eldritch outer god-like beings in the Soulsborne series before. Even more interesting is the first two lyrics of Moog, Lord of Blood on the soundtrack. These are Soul Sangui. which would roughly translate to Blood Sun from Latin. The sun being a star and all, this could even suggest that the end goal of the Formless Mother is not a distant blood star, but a bloody sun, whose light would wash over all of the lands between. In fact, the Germanic Norse version of the sun goddess is indeed named Sol. Perhaps Mikula is intended as an Empyrean to become this blood sun god. This is all, however, pure speculation. We should also consider that really much of our understanding about her motives come from Moog himself. There's a very distinct chance that much of what he is doing is either not cared about or not condoned by the Formless Mother. If we collect these theories together, they then lead us to the idea that the Formless Mother is an outer god who is perceived as a bloody star far away from the lands between. She craves wounds and her perhaps formless body is currently made up of the bloody sea found in the Mogwin dynasty. Piercing her means opening portals into that bloody sea and releasing the burning bloody essence upon your enemies. In the end, her main goal may be to become the very sun in the sky or to raise Mikola in that place in her stead. Let's move on to the final, perhaps most strange theory for the Formless Mother. Long ago, there was a time before the Erd Tree. This was likely around when the crucible of life began and the great tree grew. In that time, many things lived and roamed the lands between. Among them were the Deathrite birds. The explosive ghost flame sorcery reads, Sorcery of the servants of death strike the ground with the staff, triggering an explosion of ghost flame that burns the surrounding area. In the time when there was no Erd Tree, death was burned in ghost flame. Death birds were the keeper of that fire. Before the destined death brought by the greater will, death was governed by the death birds in a primordial flame. But they were brought to this land by another outer god, too. The twin kite shield reads, shield featuring a vividly painted twin bird. The twin bird is said to be the envoy of an outer god and the mother of the death birds. An outer godly mother who gifts her disciples flame. Sounds familiar? but it gets even stranger. When we look at the beasts that live in the Mogwin dynasty, we can find giant birds with blood boils, and perhaps most damning of all, when we bring Moog Lord of Blood to half health, he communes with the Formless Mother, using his Mogwin sacred spear, three strikes. Nihil. Nihil. Covering the area with blood, and then he grows large black wings, reminiscent of a death bird in full glory. As I mentioned earlier, the Cathedral of the Forsaken was likely used for Erd Tree burials, but also it seems was the Mogwin Palace. There are tombstones everywhere, including Mog's Arena. The map for the Mogwin Palace reads, in the lightless depths lies the grave of an ancient civilization. It is here Mog, the Lord of Blood, is building his palace to be the seat of his coming dynasty named Mogwin. And whatever nightmare, that may bring. It is not lost on me that out of the ashes of an old dead civilization, in this case Nokron, 
comes the birth of a new dynasty. It is distinctly possible that the Mother of Truth was perhaps the first goddess of the Lands Between, a creator goddess who assisted in the forming of the Crucible in the first place, one who embodied fire, flame, death and blood. She could be the god to many things in many ways, but as the Greater Will ousted the beings of the Crucible, she too was forced out. Perhaps she started as a god of death and then moved on to blood, much like we've seen as a trend in Moog's story. So what did you think of that theory? Did you think it was reasonable or delusional? Either way, I just wanted to thank you for getting this far. It means a lot to me that you were willing to hear me ramble about blood for this long. I'd also like to thank Muse for the art that she made for this channel. You can find her at Muse underscore avocado, and you can also find me at Rageikari on Twitter. Also, check out my community tab for a chance to vote on who you think I should do a video on next. Finally, a like, comment, or sub would be much appreciated. But I won't keep you any longer. Thank you. And as a great man once said, feel free to go off and die in a ditch somewhere.